Good morning, Community Chapel. Welcome back to week two of Faith and Finance. So um, if this is your first week joining, something that you will hear me say probably every single week. Um, I ask you, watch these in order as we talk about finances. All of these build upon each other, and it is very important before you've laid a foundation. So please watch all these in order. If this is your first week, I ask you, go back and watch last week's first and come back to this one. Um, But I am honored that you're here. Um, Something that I ask you to do, you would say hi to us in the comments. Um, Either like it, comment, and this isn't, we're not trying to go viral here, it's not for that reason. We want to know who all is engaged here. Um, So we're we're excited for this community that we have. Um, Something that my wife and I had felt like we were supposed to do with this is if you comment or you, you like something or you ask questions, we are going to be entering you into a drawing for a $50 gift card. Let's say again, Lee. And it has to be during the live stream. I'm so honored to have my wife here because um, I'll be honest, I can't hardly even match my clothes without her sometimes. So I'd be a mess without her. Um, so with that, we, we will be uh, doing a drawing at the end of this series for a $50 gift card. And we're also going to match a $50 uh, gift to Community Chapel as well. So um, we're honored that you all are with us today. Um, just to do a brief recap of last week, um, I want to hit some of the main points that we are going to be building on for this week. Last week, we talked about how your money is a direct reflection of your heart. And Jesus made the statement, he said, where your treasure is, there may your heart be also. Your spending is a direct reflection of your true priorities and your true values. Sometimes we accidentally deceive ourselves and we we like to think that we're really generous, but if we actually looked at our expenses, is that what it truly states? Um, Sometimes we like to think that we're responsible spenders, but we might go back and look and see we've spent a lot of money at Target or um, some other place. So if you want an objective evaluation of your heart, look at your receipts. Your receipts will reflect your true priorities 100%. Another thing that we talked about last week is how money is only a blessing to the extent of your character. The moment that your money is bigger than your ability to handle it is the moment you don't own your money, your money owns you. So, jumping into this week, I want to start with a hypothetical scenario because I want to get your your wheels turning on something. Let's say you go down to the local grocery store and uh, you go to to check out and the total of your your items is $4 and one penny. Kind of an obscure number, I know, follow me on this. Let's say you take out a $5 bill and you go to pay with it and you have 99 cents in change. What would likely happen to your 99 cents in change? Just be honest with me. I will tell you for myself, I'm probably going to lose it. I'm terrible at keeping change. Um, You know, in a realistic world, it's going to end up in the floorboards of my car. Um, In a better case scenario, maybe in my cup holders in my car or maybe in a coffee can at home that I happen to have some change laying around in. Um, Let us know in the comments. Where, Where does your loose change often end up? Um, are you a good steward of that? Do you often lose it? What happens to that for you? So, um, is there anybody popping up with anything just yet, Leonette? What happens to your loose change? Not quite yet. Well, I will move forward a little bit with this. This is the first scenario. We, for me personally, I often lose that 99 cents in this scenario. That's nearly 20% of this purchase. Now let me give you a second scenario that I want you to follow here. Let's say that all is the same. You're going to the store, you go to checkout, it's $4 and one penny, but your friend is the one who sent you to the store and they sent the $5 bill with you. So what would happen to that $5 bill if your friend sent it? I know for me, if it was someone else's money, I would make absolute sure, absolutely sure that my friend got their 99 cents back because it wasn't my money. Um, Did somebody say something, Leonette? You said, there's no change, it's a pandemic. There's no change, it's a pandemic. (laughs) Absolutely, Matthew. Well, I guess I'm totally debunked on everything for the day, so. Renee said, my change goes in the door of my car so I can have toll money when I go to Oklahoma to visit my family. And Kara said, mine goes in my wallet most of the time, sometimes in my cup holders in my car. 
wow, I am, I am inspired by other people. I just end up losing it. Um, somehow I think my, my car just devours everything from underneath my seat, so I, I don't know what happens to it. But um, So back to what I was uh, stating here. If it was your friend's money, you would be a much better steward of that money. I know for uh, me personally, if I happen to lose some of that 99 cents, I would make it right out of my own money to make sure that my friend um, received all of their money back. I would want to be an honest steward of that. So the problem with money today is often our perspective is broken. And the, and the hypothetical I gave specifically for myself is a very accurate representation of how we as a society often view our money. If we are a little reckless with it in some ways, maybe we don't care. And I'm not talking about just 99 cent purchases here. Um, I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of dollars. We often think, you know, I know I'm overspending on groceries or I know I eat out all the time and I probably shouldn't, but it's really only affecting me, so it's no big deal, right? That's how we often view money. But if we actually biblically look at it, the second scenario is a much closer picture to what is real. And let me prove it to you. I'm going to prove to you this morning that your money is not your own. Psalms 24.1, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell within. The earth, everything in the earth belongs to the Lord. Psalms 50 verse 10, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. Psalms 50 verse 10. Today I want to talk to you about stewardship and generosity. Our money is not ours, and if we want to live a truly wealthy life, and I'm not just talking wealthy like we pack our pockets full of money, I'm talking to live wealthy in the Lord, we have to learn godly stewardship and outrageous generosity. And those are going to be my points today. We're going to talk about stewardship and generosity. So I want to start by talking about stewardship, and we're going to go to Matthew 25, verse 14. So if you're following along today in your Bible, um, go to Matthew 25, verse 14. So many of you maybe notice what Bible verse that we're going to be reading, and we're going to be talking about the parable of the talents. And I love the story. Jesus is using it to illustrate the kingdom of heaven. Um, what is so interesting about this is Jesus is using a story that relates to finances to illustrate the kingdom of heaven. And I believe this is, this is such a wonderful story story about stewardship, and it happens to do with finances. Jesus is using it to illustrate the kingdom of heaven, but we can learn some really good financial principles from reading this story. So Matthew 25, verse 14, so Jesus is saying, it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he, went to, then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded them, and he made five talents more. So he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And to the one who had received five talents, he came forward Bringing, five ta bringing with him five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. And he who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in, or he said, I, you have been faithful over, over little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who had received the one talent came forward, and he said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and I gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And, and uh, to him, or, so let me see. Oh, I jumped, I jumped ahead here. I, I apologize. So take the one talent 
and give it to him who has the ten talents. For everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But to him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. I want to look at this, and there's some really huge principles that on stewardship and managing what is our master's that we can extrapolate from here. And I want to jump into this. So starting out in verse 15, it says, The master gave to each according to his ability. God entrusts us with what we have the ability to be faithful over. And Proverbs 132 says that the prosperity of a fool will destroy them. Sometimes our biggest blessing is that we don't have more money than what we can handle. It's a bit of an old statistic, but in the 1960s, they found that 70% of people who receive an inheritance will squander it within the first five years. 70% of people who receive an inheritance will devour it in five years. If it's somebody who is a lottery winner, which is another type of lump sum that somebody could get, it's even worse. Usually within three years, they are worse off financially than before they ever won the money. Now, why is this? Because they have more money than they had ability to handle that money. Remember last week, money is only a blessing to the extent of your character. The moment money exceeds that, you don't own your money, your money owns you. So a few verses later, let's get back to our story. This is in verse 20. The master calls the man with five talents. So getting to this verse, he says, In him and to he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I have made five talents more. So acknowledge what happened. The servant invested this money in a way that showed great stewardship over what he had been entrusted. He wasn't lazy but he worked it efficiently. We know he could have done what the servant with the one talent did, um, which was essentially nothing. He could have even, five talents was a tremendous amount of money in that day. He could have even stolen it and devoured it all for himself and ran away. But he didn't. He was honest and he was faithful. Now let's read verse 21 here. Going back to verse 21. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. The master acknowledges two things. He said he was good. He was faithful. Here yet again, and and then after this, he yet again acknowledges his faithfulness, saying he's going to entrust him with even more. The last part, enter into the joy of your master. Um, This is obviously talking, uh, Jesus is using this to illustrate the kingdom of heaven, but I'm thinking along this, there's something, there's a certain joy that we get when we walk in obedience and when we're faithful with what God has entrusted us with. Um, A joy that we experience here on the earth. It's not something that we have to wait till, you know, we we enter heaven to experience. Um, Our faithfulness now brings joy. Verses 22 through 23 um, we're gonna, I, I love this part here. We're going to talk about it. And he who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, this sounds pretty familiar. Some of you may be thinking, Well, Ryan, why are you, why are you going to even really expand on this? It's basically the same thing that was said earlier. Yes, but I want to look at this with a little bit different of a perspective. I want to look at this at what the person with the two talents did not do. So what did he not do? He never griped about not being entrusted with as much as the first servant. He could have said, well, master, you entrusted servant number one with five talents. I was just as faithful. Why did you not entrust me with the same amount? He could have easily taken that approach, but he didn't. How often do we personally take this approach where we'll be like, well, I work just as hard as Bill at the office and and he makes twice as much money as me or he makes 50% more money than me and, you know, I just, I think that's ridiculous. It's gross. I don't even want to try. I'm mad. Let me tell you this, and I'm, I'm just speaking to you biblically here. Remember what we established up front. Your salary is not yours and Bill's salary is not his. Insert anyone you like for Bill. You have both been entrusted. You've been entrusted with your salary. Now, write this down if you're taking notes. We are entrusted with our money, not entitled to our money. We are entrusted with our money, not entitled to our money. 
It is all the Lord's, and only the Lord is entitled to our money. So back to our story. The, this two-talent person never complained about not getting five, even though he proved equally as faithful in this scenario. What someone else is entrusted with is none of your business. Craig Rochelle has this quote that I think is so profound. He said, comparison either makes us feel inferior or superior, neither honor God. Comparison either makes us feel inferior or superior, neither honor God. Realize that if this servant would have complained, it wouldn't have been because he was mad at the person who received five talents. It would have been because he was mad at his master. If we are envious of what someone else has been entrusted with, we're not truly mad at that person. We're mad at the person who entrusted that person. We need to realize that if we are jealous of someone else, we are actually mad at God. And we don't want to be that. So realize what someone else is entrusted with is none of your business. Going on to verse 24, we're going to look at the third servant here. He who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seeds. So I was afraid. Look at how he responded here. He responded with an excuse. The excuse was followed by an interesting emotion. Verse 25, so I was afraid. So why was he afraid? Um, it says his master was a hard man. Now what, what does that mean? Um, fortunately, there's this wonderful subordinate clause that follows that that seems to elaborate a little bit further. He said, I knew you to be a hard man. It says, um, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So his ser- the servant was intimidated by how wealthy and powerful that his master truly was. This lack of faithfulness was a direct reflection of the impairment on the relationship between the servant and the master. He was afraid. This says more about the relationship than it does the money. If the servant would have gotten over his fear, he might have proved more faithful. So what did he do as a result of this fear? Essentially nothing. I would say if we take an honest look at our money today, we're often worse than this third servant. Not only do we do nothing, but we often do the wrong things. We often do the wrong things. We consume recklessly what God has entrusted us with. We often get greedy or idolatrous with our stuff. Um, Many times we buy things recklessly in the hopes that we're somehow going to have happiness or fulfillment. But let me tell you this. If we put our happiness and fulfillment on anything other than the Lord, it's idolatry. If we put our happiness and fulfillment on anything other than the Lord, that is idolatry. This servant was evil because he did not have the right relationship with his master he should have had. His money was a symptom of relational weakness. He was fearful. He was intimidated. His financial action reflected that. So we are managers of our master's money. It's already his. What we do with it is a reflection of our relationship with him and our understanding of his expectations. And I want us to look at our money personally with that perspective. Um, Maybe some of us listening today haven't really known what God's expectations are. Well, this is, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm hoping we can establish that in these coming weeks. I want to move to my second point today, which is on giving. Now, giving comes a lot easier when we realize, first and foremost, it's not ours to begin with. Pride and greed become much more difficult to acquire when we realize it's not our money to be prideful or greedy over. Gratitude comes naturally when you realize you are entrusted, not entitled. I want to say that one again because I think that's really important. A little bit of a tangent here, but realize gratitude comes naturally when we realize we are entrusted, not entitled. You have been entrusted with your salary. Don't gripe about it. Random fact, if you actually have a household income more than $34,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of the world. Oftentimes, it's funny, I hear people complain about one percenters. Well, 
Ironically, most people who complain about one percenters are still one percenters. They just only compare it to the United States instead of looking at the world. Realize if you have a household income of $14,000 a year, you are still at the 86th percentile of the world today. So exercise gratitude. Before we tell God what we don't have, why don't we start thanking Him for what we do? Gratitude comes naturally when we realize that we are entrusted, not entitled. I want to go this morning to 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. We're going to talk about generosity here. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase your harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. Through, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. I love, I feel like that second to last sentence really encaps, or it encapsulates the heart of what this is saying. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. This is one of the reasons you often hear today that people, people will knock wealth. They will talk about wealth negatively. If you manage wealth according to God's principles, wealth is a beautiful thing. We need to realize that God, it, it's just like God told Abraham. He said, you are blessed to be a blessing. You are blessed to be a blessing. We are enriched in every way to be generous in every way. I think if we were to look at this biblically, true wealth is in what is given, not what is kept. The best way to live a small life is to narrow the focus on something as small as yourself. Big lives, however, require big focus, and big generosity. There's this beautiful precedent in nature that I think really encapsulates what I'm trying to illustrate here. When we're looking throughout Scripture, we see the Dead Sea and we see the Sea of Galilee mentioned several times. The Sea of Galilee has streams flowing into it and streams flowing out of it. And the Sea of Galilee supports life. There's wildlife, there's fish, there's all kinds of life going on in the Sea of Galilee. But the Dead Sea, however, only has water coming in. And ironically, the Dead Sea can't support life, despite the fact its surface area is four times larger than the Sea of Galilee. The Dead Sea is actually full of, it's full of salt, and nothing can live in its waters. I think this is a pretty good metaphor for our finances. The best way for our financial lives to begin to suffer is for us to shut off the valve of outflow or our giving. When we give, we thrive with life. But when we don't, something about us dies. Remember that verse, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. You know, oftentimes when we read verses like 2 Corinthians um, 9 here where we were reading, we often read and we give with the expectation of receiving. But I want to ask you this, what if we received with the expectation of giving? I want to say that again, just as a thought. Oftentimes we give with the expectation of receiving, but what if we received with the expectation of giving? You will be enriched in every way to be generous. So how do we, how do we be generous? What does generosity look like? I want to give you seven principles today that I think really give us a baseline expectation of what generosity truly is. And um, realize I could talk about this. I could spend the entire month of August on generosity. There is, it's such a wonderful topic. I've, I've tried to condense it down to these principles um, that I want you to have. The first of which, and, and this is my favorite, and I have to give my wife full credit for this because I think it's absolutely beautiful. When it comes to generosity, the first thing we need to do is recognize generosity as a characteristic of God. 
the more we get to know God, the more we ourselves become givers. The gift of Jesus is the archetypal, quintessential example. It's the perfect example of what generosity truly is. It was selfless. It was love. It was something that could never be repaid. Yet Jesus gave it anyways. The second thing we need to do is recognize that everything we have is not ours. It's God's. Everything we have is not ours. It's God's. We have no right to be greedy over something that is not our own. That's called theft. It's God's. So we have no right to be stingy. We don't want to be like the servant with the one talent. He managed his master's money in a way that did not honor his master's wishes. We want to recognize that everything we have is God's. It's not our own. The third thing is we give with the expectation of nothing in return. Now, this is a tricky one, and I want to be really careful. The Bible says that if we sow, we reap. It is a biblical precedent, and I can't, I, I can't emphasize this enough. It is a biblical precedent that the Lord blesses a righteous giver. And so I am all about, when you go to give, pray. Pray that the Lord multiplies the seed that is being sown. Pray that the Lord helps you to continue to be a diligent and cheerful giver. But what I am trying to say with this is, is listen to this line here. Trusting the Lord for a blessing is much different than feeling entitled from the Lord to that blessing. Trusting the Lord for a blessing is much different than feeling entitled of the Lord to that blessing. We never, and especially when we're giving to other people, we never give to other people while expecting something from them. So some questions. How generous are you to seemingly insignificant people around you? Are you a generous tipper at restaurants? Are you moved by causes that solely affect other people? Maybe it's missions or human trafficking. How often do you go out of the way to hold the door for someone else? We want to give with the expectation of nothing in return. The fourth thing is I want us to really examine what we consider generosity in our own lives. And I'm going to steal this quote from Dave Ramsey. It's so perfect. He says that a gift with strings attached is not a gift, it's a manipulation. A gift with strings attached is not a gift, it is a manipulation. So if you buy your friend's food with the expectation that they're going to be a better friend, you're not being generous to your friend, you are manipulating your friend. If you help your neighbor with their yard work, but you secretly have the expectation that they're going to come and they better come and they better help you rake your leaves when you need it, you're not being kind to your neighbor, you're being a manipulator to your neighbor. So we need to realize that if we are going to give, and this is just a wonderful principle to put into every area of your life, your marriage, your relationship with your church, um, anyone that you are serving, remember that a gift with strings attached is not a gift, it is a manipulation, and we are not manipulators. Number five, always start with the tithe. The tithe is a tenth of your income, and it is a baseline expectation of stewardship Um, illustrated in the Bible. And I want you to notice in Malachi chapter 3, the Lord says, return the tithe. Why does he use the word? He didn't say give the tithe. He said, return the tithe. Now, if we return something, it implies that it belonged to the person who is receiving it to begin with. It says return the tithe because the tithe is already the Lord's, as well as the other 90% of your salary. God knows that if we don't give a dime out of a dollar, we'll never give a million out of 10 million. We'll never give a hundred million out of a billion. Sir John Templeton, he's one of the greatest investors that ever lived. He has this quote that he says, he's never known anyone who tithes over 10 years who did not massively grow their financial wealth. When we are honest stewards and we give what the Lord has called us to do, the Lord is then able to begin to bless us. Number six, and I can't illustrate this one enough. This is such a huge principle. True wealth begins where your finite perspective ends. True wealth begins where your finite perspective ends. One of my favorite money verses, Proverbs 22, 9, it says, Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. I love that expression, bountiful eye. I think that's beautiful. We often see today through a scarcity mindset. We often tell ourselves, I can't give because I can't afford to not have it. I can't afford to lose it. Scarcity focuses on our finite supply. Abundance focuses on God's infinite supply. 
Scarcity focuses on our finite supply. Abundance focuses on God's infinite supply. Tony Robbins has this uh, incredible story that I think really illustrates this, this, uh, this idea of scarcity and abundance. He said at one point in time, he was under really hard financial times, and he had recently loaned a friend $1,200, and his friend was supposed to pay him back and never did, and Tony Robbins was down to his last 25 bucks. Um, he has no idea what he, what's going to happen after that. Where is he going to sleep? How is he going to eat? And so he's down to his last 25 bucks. He's angry. He's bitter. But he's trying to figure his life out. And he says, you know what? I'm going to go down to the closest buffet I can find. And I am going to stuff my face to try to get through the next couple of days of not eating. And so he goes down to the local buffet. And he, he had to walk. He said he didn't have the gas uh, in his car. He couldn't afford the gas. He couldn't afford the parking. So he walks down to the local buffet. And he sits down and he begins to eat his meal. And as he's eating, he notices this little boy and his mom walk in. And he said this little boy just captivated his attention. He said this little boy was dressed up really nice. And he noticed that as he walked over to the table, he pulled the chair out for his mom and helped his mom sit down. And then the little boy went and sat down himself. And Tony Robbins, he paid for his, his own meal and he walked over to, to that table and he looked at the little boy and he spoke to him and he said, excuse me, I want to acknowledge you for being such an extraordinary little gentleman. He said, it's amazing that you're treating your lady like this. And the little boy kind of embarrassed was like, well, actually, she's my mom. And uh, Tony said, wow, that's even cooler. It's amazing you're taking her to lunch today. And the little boy, uh, again, kind of embarrassed, um, he, he looked back at Tony and uh, he said, well, I really can't because... I'm only eight and I don't have a job yet. And uh, Tony replied, yes, you're taking her to lunch. In that moment, Tony said he reached into his pocket and he grabbed every bit of money, every bit of change that he had left to his name and he slapped it on the table. And the little boy looked at him and said, well, I can't accept that. And Tony said, yes, you can. I'm bigger than you are. And uh, Tony walked out of the restaurant and he said he, he didn't walk home, he flew home. And, and I say all this because this illustrates such a big point. Tony made the statement he said that I found so profound. He said, that was the day that I became a rich man. The day he gave absolutely, he had nothing left to his name. He said that was the day he became a, health, a rich man. Um, ironically, I think the next day, it was either later that day or sometime that week, it was really soon after that, his friend, he happened to get a letter in the mail with $1,300 in it. And his friend said, I'm sorry I've been ducking your calls I'm sorry I haven't been there for you when you've needed me. Here's your money back plus a little interest. Um, I want to make this statement. He said that was the day that he became a wealthy man. What wealth happens when you truly master your money? And I want you to know this. Know that what you can give up, you have mastered. What you can't give up has mastered you. What you can give up, you have mastered. What you can't give up has mastered you. When we are mastered by money, we are in scarcity. We are focusing on our finite supply. But when we master money, we are in abundance because we are focusing on God's infinite supply. Number seven, realize that a lot of generosity is giving to people who are totally incapable of ever repaying you. Later on in Matthew 25, where we were reading the parable of the talents, verses 31 through 46 talks about helping others. And in verse 40, Jesus says, truly I say to you, what you did to the least of these, you did for me. The true measure of your wealth is not, is your, the true measure of your wealth is in what is given, not accumulated. If you have, Sir John Templeton, he has this quote right here. He says, if you have a billion dollars and you're ungrateful, you're a poor man. If you have very little, but you are grateful for what you have, you are truly rich. So to conclude today, the secret to honoring God and being absurdly wealthy is to realize you are a manager of your money, not an owner. Remember, we are entrusted to our money, not entitled to our money. Number two, we have to be outrageously generous. Realize that you are blessed to be a blessing. You are enriched in every way to be generous in every way. We're not going to be a dead sea. We're going to be generous. Winston Churchill says, we make a living by what we get, we make a life by what we give. Tony Robbins has another quote that I, I love. He says, the secret to living is giving. 
Oftentimes we give with the expectation of receiving, but what if we received with the expectation of giving? Because remember, it's not ours to begin with. These first two weeks we've been um, looking at ourselves before we really look at our money. And before we change our behaviors, we have to change our heart. When we get who we are right, the money part begins to, it happens on its own. And again, something I've, I've said in the first week, I want to reiterate this week, I never want to teach a greedy person how to get rich. I never want to teach a fearful person how to build an emergency fund to hedge off crisis because they're only going to trust their money and not the Lord. I don't want to teach an idolatrous person how to save and make a, a big purchase because I would only give them something, something to idolize. We have to get our hearts right so we respond like the servants who had the five talents and the two talents. We don't want to squander what we've been entrusted with. We want to honor our master. And before we focus on what we are to do with our money, we need to focus on who we are. Um, as Craig Rochelle says, he says, it's not about the do, it's about the who. And that's who I want you to look at today. I want you to look at yourself. Um, do we have any questions today in the comments? No questions. No yeah. questions. Any Lots of good comments, just interaction. Oh, okay. And, you know, read, read me some of them. I want to hear. Um, infinity, in, Tambra said Infinity War Tithe Edition. <laughs> infinity War Tithe Edition. <laughs> She also said, don't be salty. <laughs> <laughs> don't be salty. I love it. Yeah, and there's a lot of boom. That's good stuff right there. Awesome. Polar was like, wow, so good. Um, and then a really good comment I feel like Tambor made was from experience. This is tough stuff. It is tough stuff, but it's, it's still good. It's still valid. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, any questions, hit us up with them. Um, yeah, it's funny. I was Jeff and I have talked. Um, Jeff, and my wife and I have talked prior to us ever coming on, and we said, you know, this looks like a um, finance message, but it is really a uh, it's really a Bible study. Let me see. Checking everything here. Um, I'm going to check myself. So, I want to tell everyone thank you so much for um, for interacting with us today, and um, it's been so good to have everyone virtually. Um, something that um, we, my wife and I really, from the bottom of our heart, want to thank Community Chapel for having us this month. It's, it's really been um, an honor uh, for us to be here. And also, if you have anything that maybe you have some deep personal questions, but you don't want to ask them publicly, please message my wife. Her name is Leonette Ferguson, um, L-E-A, capital A-N-N-E-T-T-E. Um, it took me several months of dating her before I could spell her name properly. Um, but if you have a private question that you would like us to address, please feel free to, um, to reach out to her. Um, also, um, something as well that if you are, maybe you're in a personal crisis, I understand that this COVID situation has been one of the most job insecure events that we've had in decades. And so if you are, if you are in that situation, I want you to begin to work these principles and realize that principles work in good times and bad. Um, so work these principles and, and allow the word to work in your money. Do we? Jen Kohler asked, do you have any good uh, books you recommend on generosity? Any good books that I recommend on generosity? Um, so there are a few books that I absolutely love. Um, one of my favorite finance books is called The Legacy Journey by Dave Ramsey. Um, it is all about what the Bible says on wealth and money. And um, I think, in my opinion, that's, that's the best that I've ever read on um, being generous and being a good steward. Um, and you'll notice as you read that book, and I, I'll, I'll be up front with, uh, with everybody here, I don't, I don't pretend to be um, an expert. I just read a lot of what experts say. And so um, that's a terrific book. Another um, great book is called Money, Master the Game by Tony Robbins. And I'll tell you, it's not... Um, it's not per se a Christian book, but um, at the end of it, he has, he has a chapter where uh, I believe it's called The Secret of Living is Giving, um, and it talks a tremendous amount of generosity, and he actually donated um, hundreds of meal, millions of meals to hungry families um, off the proceeds of that book, and so it talks about how to responsibly build wealth, but why you should do it is to be generous. And so those are, I would say those are my two favorite books on 
um, generosity. You'll notice that Money Master, the game, the majority of it is not about that, but the last chapter is terrific, and it talks about that. Do we, any other questions? Um, Debbie Meiser said, love this. Uh, Cindy Lexwell said, I agree. This is a really good Bible study. Thank you so much for sharing this. My pleasure. Cassie Davis said, great teaching, great lesson for us, even better to share with our children, so that's awesome. Awesome. I love that. And then T Tambra said, sometimes it's just good to refocus on the core values of Christ-centered finance. It's super easy to get distracted in the world we currently live in. Thank you, bunches. Yeah, Renee my pleasure. said, can you, can you put in the comments the principles you gave? Yeah, yeah, we can we can do that. We'll uh, we'll go back and, and outline outline those for you as well. So um, wonderful. It's 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 an honor to have everybody interacting, and it's it's really an honor to get to be with you all. Um, a comment we had uh, last week, I believe Cecilia commented saying that um, she had thought we were supposed to pay off the larger debts first, and uh, we talked about paying off debt uh, was a little bit of last week and. Um, just to go back and address that one, we didn't see it until we had just gotten off the live stream. But um, yeah, that was, a t that was a terrific comment. We want to pay off those smaller debts first because we want those wins along the way. Um, you know, I, I look at it like going to the gym. If you had to work out for 20 years and then at the end of 20 years, you finally saw the results. Everything, you looked great. You, looked, you, you, know, you felt like you had nothing for 20 years and then at the end of that, bam, you had all the results. I know for myself, I would be way too discouraged to keep working out. And so the reason we pay off those smaller debts first is generally speaking, they're the higher interest rates anyways. That's not why we're doing it. Um, so that, that's helpful. But the main thing is we get those small victories along the way. We want to see progress. We want to get that, uh, that accomplishment snowball rolling. Um, where you just feel, you feel that progress happening and it gives you motivation and then you get more excited and you want to attack those one by one. So that's why uh, last week, uh, to go back and address that comment, that's why we do those as well. So um, any other questions? Um, you know, it doesn't particularly have to be about these first two lessons, but any other money questions that anybody might have, feel free to ask. Um, we're, we're glad to, to help. We have, still have some time if, if anybody has anything that um, they've been wanting to ask is... Anything else coming in? Not yet, not yet. Not yet, all right. Well, I'm going to say a prayer for us, and if you have any questions, please please jump in. Um, I, wanna, I wanna say a prayer for you, though, and your family and your finances at home, and um, just believe the Lord um, with you this morning. It's, uh, that's something we're really excited about, is not just to teach, but to come beside you in faith. So, dear Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you, Lord, for everybody that is listening today. I thank you, Lord, um, for their hearts that are hungry to learn, and um, I, I know, Lord, they woke up a little bit earlier to hear this material, Lord, and um, I pray, Lord, today that you would help to instill your principles within them, Lord. This is not, um, this is not a get-rich-quick thing. This is about how do we build a legacy for Jesus. God, I want to pray today, Lord, that you would help us all to manage our money according to the principles that you've said. We're going to realize, Lord, that we're not managers, or that we're, we're not owners, that we are managers. We're going to realize, Lord, that you have entrusted us, and it is our privilege to get to work with what you have entrusted us with. We're going to um, remember that we are going to develop our own character. We're not going to look at our our behavior. We're not going to look at our behaviors first. We're going to look at our heart first, because our behaviors flow from our heart. And we have to get to the root of everything, which is our heart. And we know that you said, where your treasure is, may your heart be also. God, expose to us our true priorities. If there's, other, if there's areas of our spending that do not reflect who we think that we are, we may think that we're um, very secure, but we may be looking and seeing that we're buying a lot of things that prop up our self-image. Or maybe we think that um, we're very generous, but we find that we're actually just spending way too much at Chipotle and Target. Um, Lord, I pray that you would help us to really expose our true priorities and um, God to really honor you with those. God, I thank you so much, Lord, for this day. I pray that um, you would bless everyone's finances here, Lord. I pray that this would be an enlightening um, message to marriages today. I pray that this would be something that would begin to get us focused, Lord, on the things that are truly important. So many times financially, we're chasing urgent things. Um, 
you know, maybe it's traveling, uh, traveling basketball with the kids, or maybe it's um, fighting medical bills and feeling like we're constantly firefighting, Lord. But I pray that we would begin to put these principles in place to focus on the important, Lord, because we know that when we honor you with our money, it goes much further than what it could ever do without. And we know that, Lord, it's your money to begin with. It's not our own. So we pray that our perspective and, more importantly, our values come around what your word says. Lord, we're not going to fit you into our budget. We are going to build our budget on you. And we thank you so much for that today, Lord. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Any last-minute comments before we call it a day? Matthew said, do you even lift, bro? Do I even lift, bro? No, COVID killed that. No. <laughs> that was rich, as Pastor would say. Awesome. Good deal. Well, thank you all so much for joining. We will see you next week.